This is the Dean, the Dean Show. This is the Dean Show. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, assalamu alaikum, peace be unto you. I'm Eddie, your host, and you are watching The Dean Show. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of The Dean Show. We have another person's story. So many people, this is a phenomenon. So many people are coming to Islam. They're realizing, you know what, this life is going to end soon. I better get with it. I better figure out what the purpose of life is. And my next guest figured out what the purpose of life is and what he needs to be doing while he's here on this earth. And we're going to hear his story Story, coming up next, Sheikh Abdul Hakim Quick, here on The Dean Show. You don't want to go nowhere. This is The Dean, The Dean Show. This is 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 the Dean Show. Abdullah Hakim, quick on the Dean Show, back again. Yes, sir. Now, you have your own private section, you know that, at thedeanshow.com. <laughs> People can go there, they can read your bio, and they can see the other program that we did w with yourself, talking about the holidays, where they originated from. Mm -hmm. But today, we're going to be talking about your unique journey to Islam. You used to be a Christian, mm -hmm. now you're a Muslim, one who's chosen to consciously submit to the one God, worshiping mm -hmm. Him alone, and not what He created. Let's talk about your life before Islam. How did this all start? You grew up in uh, Canada, America? Okay. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, Wassalatu I was born in Boston, Massachusetts, Boston. right northeast corner of the United States. And alhamdulillah, um, my family was a good, hard-working family. My father was a welder. He used to go high up on buildings. And my mother was a very religious person in the Christian church. Mm -hmm. So I was raised... Um, with good values and I would attend the church and um, we were Episcopalians so that's very close to Catholic mm -hmm. so we had communion and uh, you know different uh, rituals that are very similar to the Catholic Church but uh, as, a, as, as a young man and we were living at that time in Cambridge which is a section of Boston where Harvard and MIT is there was sort of a class stratification <clears throat> within the church itself and I could feel the pressure of um, you know, being part of a society where I was, being, I was left out. Um, and um, I started to question things. And this was the 60s. 60s. And the 60s was, as you know, a turbulent time in America. Um, it was the age of Aquarius, as they said. And yeah. People were questioning their identity, questioning religion. And as a young person, uh, I, I believed strongly in the Creator. <clears throat> and I used to pray the Lord's Prayer constantly. And, um, you know, I, I had a solid belief in God, but I couldn't accept um, the image of Christ the way they uh, depicted it. Because I used to study history a lot. Yes. And I knew that the people living in the Middle East, you know, had a different um, uh, appearance than, than, than Jesus. And they were saying that this is God or the Son of God, and then putting an appearance upon him that was not Middle Eastern. Uh, then in the communion itself, they, they, they had rituals where we were eating the body of Christ and drinking His blood and things like that. And These are some of the rituals that go yeah, on Yeah, this church. is in the communion where they give you the, the wafer and they say, eat this, this is the body of Christ that has been shed for you. And then you drink the little bit of wine, they say, drink this, this is the blood of Christ that has been shed for you. So when the thin wafer and the blood um, come together, it's almost um, it's like skin. It tastes like a piece of skin with blood on it. So you're eating human flesh? Yeah, so, so you, you get this sensation that, that you have human flesh um, in your mouth and blood. And I said, this is not um, the religion. I mean, I read about vampires and yeah. you know, this type of culture, and, and I couldn't associate that with the, um, the law of Moses, what Jew, G, uh, Jewish people were doing, because you know, within the Jewish tradition, there's nothing like this. Yes. And so I, I was having a problem, and then uh, you know, even the rituals of the Easter 
celebration and Christmas and you know the connection you know with uh, nature based things and so I, I was confused uh, you know at a young age and I left the church and so what age were you when you left the church at that time I was about 17 years old so you were doing you're a young man doing your homework yes yeah, so I was doing my homework and I was uh, studying and I was fortunate you know we lived in a uh, uh, you know the three-story you know housing tenement you know uh, which was in Cambridge in between big universities but in our community center the students used to come and tutor us so we had access to knowledge and so I used to you know do a lot of questioning uh, reading National Geographic reading history books you know to try to find out what was outside of the United States and, and this really you know I think gave me that you know broad look you know, that, 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 you know, spurred me on, you know, to look beyond, you know, the narrow teachings that I was finding within the church. See, we hear that today, a 17-year-old, to be discussing or looking into religion the way you were at 17, were, was this prevalent at that time? Were more youth, more inquisitive about wanting to know <clears throat> about God and religion? I, I wouldn't say it was prevalent, but, you know, within this particular community center, there were a number of uh, very enlightened students who wanted to pass off information you know, to the children of the ghetto, so to speak. And so, you know, our minds met, and I was wide open. And so um, we had access to um, international affairs and, and also to history books. We could question, you know, we could put it together. Um, and, and so this is what gave me this world view from an early age. And, and, and as I was studying, I ran into the image of um, Sultan Salah al mm -hmm. Al-Ayubi, Rahimahullah. He's the famous Muslim leader of the Crusades. Yes. And um, even the Christians, when they looked at Salah Hadim, they looked at him you know, as a very kind and merciful person, a noble person, a dignified person. Didn't they make a movie? It's like in Hollywood, they made some kind of movie about Yeah, they, they were making movies. I mean, it's only recently that um, they came up with a, 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 you know, a very important movie yeah. on Salah Hadim, um, The Kingdom of Heaven. Yes. You know, and then that one has got, you know, shows him. But I was really looking at it from a historical point of view. You know, you know, and, and what they were talking about, the Holy Land. You know, and, and I was anxious to travel to the Holy Land and, you know, to see this, uh, you know, this, this image of this person and the people he represented. Because the, the Islamic world, you know, was not clear to us. We were never given an image. I mean, it was exotic. It was Alibaba and the 40 Thieves yeah. and Aladdin and the Lamp. Uh -huh. You know, Open Sesame and yeah. Thousand and One Arabian Nights. But uh, we didn't have access to what it was, so I, I was yearning to find out. Um, you know, plus the fact that I, you know, I, I, I am an African American and I'm searching for my roots. You know, and I see in West Africa also great heroes, mm -hmm. great leaders. Uh, Shekwith Mandanfodio uh, of uh, Sokoto, Mansa Musa, the great emperor of Mali. And, uh, and all this at this young age of 17? At this young age, this 17, 18. You know, I, I, was, I, I was a good student in school. This should be an inspiration you know, and, to, the, to the kids at that age who are just stuck on the Xbox and the TV and, and all these other things. You are at 17. If you were able to do it, they can do it too. That's right, because even with the Internet itself, Internet is you know, not just for, for sport and play, but with an Internet, you, know, you have a lot of information. So, so you know, these uh, different forms of technology are only tools that we can use to benefit ourselves. When I was young, we only had National Geographic and you know things like that, and you know some sort of uh, documentaries and uh, films, and you know so we had to go to film libraries and yeah. you know read you know special books in order to get this information. So let's back up just a little bit before we move forward. So you believe that Jesus? You said you believed in God, but now there were some of these rituals you weren't identifying with. You were studying history; things weren't adding up. Wasn't making sense. Yeah. But did you believe before that that Jesus was God? That He died for your sins? This was a problem for me. Um, you know, I, I believed that people were sinful, but, but for me, the most powerful uh, uh, image of creation was the Creator. And when you read the Lord's Prayer, you are saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. So you're speaking to the Father, to the Creator. The one God. The one God. So for me, um, because in my area, it was a mixed area. There was black, Spanish, white. We were living together. You know, and so... Um, there's a one God who's above all of us. And, and you can't take a face of, of a certain image of a certain race and say, that's God. Because all of us are the children of God, so to speak. So I couldn't accept the, you know, the image of a man. And I was searching for you know, a, a, a bigger concept you know, of God. And I, I was making my Lord's Prayer and, 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 and then searching. And, and you know, so I left the church 
you know, and, and I started to search. Making the Lord's Prayer, and we're going to end with that. Until we come back with more, we're going to take a break. We'll be right back on the D show. I am not afraid to stand alone. I am not afraid to stand alone. If a lies by my side, I am not afraid to stand alone. I am not afraid to stand alone. If a lies by my side, I am not afraid to stand alone. I am not afraid to stand alone. If a lies by my side, I am not afraid to stand alone. Back here on the Dean Show with Abdullah Hakim Quick, and we left off with it, it just wasn't fitting, it didn't make sense. You're saying the Lord's Prayer, praying to the one God. This is something that it, it just goes with what's intrinsically inside of you, isn't it? That's right. Don't, do you find that most people, they have a problem with this, but some people just overlook it and they're just, you know, sliding in on Sunday, just going with the flow, don't even question it. Yeah. You were questioning it. Yeah, most people accept you know, the dogma, the, the, the rituals, that this is just the church, you have to do it. Whenever you question, we were told it's a mystery. Yeah. And so we're not sure what this mystery is. But I said, no, there's got to be an answer to the mystery. Sherlock Holmes, you know, was solving all kinds of <laughs> mysteries, man. Yeah. So why can't I uh -huh. solve a mystery? Yeah. You know, and so this, this is really what the search, uh, you know, led me, you know, to. And then I traveled, uh, you know, in university. Yeah. I was in Pennsylvania first. And I went to Reed College in Portland, Oregon. So I was on the West Coast in the 60s. Yeah. And that was a real turbulent place. Yeah. Things were going off and we formed a black student union. You know, we wanted um, you know, to have African studies and in the university we struggled for it and we were actually given you know, a black studies program. Um, but this, you know, I, I was still not satisfied with what I was getting and um, I left the university. Were your parents concerned? Did your parents try to have you or did you go to try to talk to someone of knowledge and to have a dialogue and ask these tough questions? Yes, I mean I was you know going to different religious leaders, Buddhism, Hinduism, yeah. uh, forms of Christianity. Mm -hmm. I even ran into people from the Nation of Islam. Mm -hmm. You know and you know I, I, I attended the Nation of Islam's you know center there you know in um, uh, uh, Portland, Oregon. Mm -hmm. but, but that W w was not satisfying to me either because um, I was raised in a mixed area so I couldn't accept the supremacy of one group over another whether it's white over black or black over white. So this is the nation now? That was the nation of Islam. Okay. So even that did not satisfy me. Yeah, because aren't they now worshipping another man? Yeah, so they're worshipping a man and then they're also talking supremacy. Yeah. You know, and so that didn't satisfy me either. Which, which Islam is totally eradicated. Of course. No racism whatsoever. That's right. The real Islam yeah. is something different, but I hadn't found that yet. Yeah. So I left the university, went back home, and I was drafted. You were drafted. Because this was the Vietnam War. Yeah. And again, I, was, I had access to information. And so uh, I checked out the history of that part of the world, and I had, you know, uh, you know some information about what was really going on. And I said, no, I mean, I'm not going to go over there and then fight people you know, who have never done anything to me. I mean, I don't understand this. When we were still suffering with civil rights, you know, the struggle was going on, people were being you know, murdered, uh, great leaders assassinated, you know, why should I you know, get involved in this? So I was drafted and I decided that you know, instead of being involved in the confusion at the time, I would just leave in search of knowledge. So I left the United States and I went to Canada yes. you know, as a war resistor. And um, I, you know, was welcomed here uh, in Canada. And um, but I, so I was moving away from confusion and war, and I ran into Islam. Yeah. So back back it up. So you just you didn't want to go hurting people. You wanted to live your life, seek truth, be a good human being, and you just didn't feel like, hey, this is the right thing. I'm not gonna go kill somebody. That's right. Poor, poor people going to kill poor people. That's right. I mean, why you know get involved in something like this? You know, it doesn't make sense wasn't explained properly and again I had access to people from Harvard University yeah. and from MIT you know the anti-war movement was very powerful in Cambridge yeah. uh, at the time so I had access to you know information that many of the the youth coming out of the you know black community you know did not have access to weren't like Muhammad Ali and Martha Luther King they were kind of doing the same thing yes they were so so there was a certain level within the society now generally on the lower level where I was coming from you know people submitted because Nobody even thought about leaving home because the United States was the world, we would yeah. call it. This is the world. 
you know, we don't speak another language, you know, we don't have access to other information except, you know, Superman and Superfly and the things yeah. that are given to us. You know, so now um, I decided to move because I was reading National Geographic, going to the documentary film, you know, programs, you know, so I left the United States, went to Canada and started a new life. Yeah. And it was here in Canada, you know, that I, you know, ran into the teachings of Islam. I went to a library and I picked up a copy of the Quran and then I began to read it in the life of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. I said, no, this was the person that I was looking for. Now, now, now hold on, before, you, before we go down there, Rod, tell us, you also, okay, we, we covered Christianity, but you mentioned some other religions. You also, did you, you looked into Buddhism and Hinduism, some of these other mm -hmm. world religions? Right, so at, at the time, you know, on Reed College campus, this yeah. was one of the experimental uh, yeah. colleges like Swarthmore and Oberlin and Antioch. You know, so, so on that campus, there's a lot of like, um, you know, uh, different, you know, new age religions and whatnot. Yeah. So I was reading into them and trying yoga and meditation and whatnot. And, but it didn't really satisfy me because it wasn't giving me a world view. It wasn't connecting me to the creator because I'm coming out of a Judeo-Christian background. Yeah. So these religions didn't really satisfy what I was looking for. So you had <clears throat> checked up, looked into, investigated all the different major religions and it just didn't provide the logical, rational, no. scientific evidence? No. Now we come to Islam, what happened? Now when I came to Islam and I realized that this is an extension and the completion of the, of, of the great religions of monotheism, this was answering you know, my, my questions. You weren't blindly, obviously, from your investigation as a 17-year-old, you were analytically, scientifically, logically, you're an intellectual, you were looking at this in the, from an intellectual uh, uh, perspective. That's right. Yeah. So now, th did Islam capture you in that way? So then, you know, this is where the interest came. Yeah. But it, it was the, the example of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. I mean, how he lived and how he treated other people. He had all different nations around him. Yes. You know that the concepts. It was. It made sense to me. I had stopped eating pork. Um, I wasn't drinking alcohol. Um, you know, I was trying to live a decent life, although I wasn't a Muslim. Yeah. You know, and so I was looking for something that would you know, give me that world view, would, um, you know, talk about my own roots, you know, connect me to the Creator, uh, and then give me a lifestyle. And so I found all of these things in Islam. I had a lifestyle, I had a dietary plan, I had a way to conduct my marriage. Everything was A way there. to raise, I was a package. In Islam. It was a way of life. From A to Z. From A to Z. So no that, guesswork? So, so this, that, that, that was what I wanted. Wow. And fortunately, um, you know, I met, um, I was taken by some uh, friends from Pakistan. I asked them about Islam. They said, no, go to the center. And there was a very uh, well-known person, Dr. Ahmed Saka, uh, who's a famous Lebanese, um, you know, doctor from America who was up with the Muslim Student Association. And um, so I sat with him and he convinced me and he gave me shahada. Uh, so alhamdulillah, I became so Muslim. So what did you go get dipped in the back of a pool? What, what happened? Did no, I mean... Did you do something weird? What was it that you, you became a Muslim and you said some, you know, Arabic terms. Now you said you took a shahada, you became a Muslim. Can you define these? What, what was the procedure? Yeah, basically uh, the procedure is, I mean, once, you know, the person um, sees where you're coming from and, you know, he saw that um, I believed in one God. One God. I was searching for the one God. Was this a moon God, an Arab God? No, this is not the moon God. This is the creator. The, the, the God of Abraham, Moses, Jesus, you know, Adam, all of the prophets from the beginning of time. That's the God that Jesus prayed to? That's the God Jesus prayed to, Moses prayed to, Abraham prayed to, uh, Adam, the first man, prayed to, that all of the, the prophets. And that I, had, I was familiar with the example and life of the prophet Muhammad ibn Abdullah, peace be upon him, from Arabia. And I could see that he was the fulfillment yeah. He was the comforter. He was the one that Jesus was speaking about, that Moses was speaking about. And so I, I had these two aspects. And basically, uh, Dr. Saka you know, showed me that that means you are a Muslim. You are a Muslim, and we're going to be right back to find out more of this exciting story on the Dean Show. Be right back. There will always be someone that will be there to say something negative. But at the same time, there will be someone there to say something positive also. So just hold on to the rope of Allah. Everything in this universe rely and need Allah. The Quran says don't kill women, don't kill children, don't kill the old people, don't attack the civilians. This is what the Prophet Muhammad told us. Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah said that the Prophet never ever start a war against anybody. 
you're a Muslim now, and <coughs> continue on. What happened from there? So from there, um, basically, without any major ritualistic uh, process, you know, I entered into Islam, and it was about knowledge and uh, you know, gaining this lifestyle. Now, fortunately for me, it was right before Ramadan. Now, this is a test, but I was serious. You know, it was two days before Ramadan. So I went back to you know, my apartment, and I, I learned to read uh, the, the opening chapter of the Quran, Al-Fatiha. Um, you know, I, I got my basic uh, you know, movements together, and I went to the masjid you know, on the first day of Ramadan. I started fasting right away. Mm -hmm. So I fasted, and I went to the, to the masjid, and they took me to the Jami Mosque and they prayed 20 rakats. Now, I used to play basketball, right? And I used to wear like leg weights on my legs and, you know, yeah. so my knees, right? Uh -huh. So after about the 20th rakat, I said like, if this is Islam, I don't know if I can make it, man. Uh -huh. like, I don't know if I can handle this. Yeah. If this is what, you know, these people do, right? Now you're thinking maybe I got to do this every night. Yeah, because this is <laughs> fanatical, man. Yeah. This is, they said, no, brother, this is Ramadan, you, you have your choice. So this is now Ramadan, this is, can you explain for our viewers why it was so many, this is just... What yeah, this is now a special prayer in the evenings of Ramadan, Salatul Tarawih. Yeah. And, and this is the prayer that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, because it was a special month, yeah. he used to make special prayers in the, the, the Jami Mosque with his followers. And, and of course it was, you know, a prayer of relaxation. This is what Tarawih is giving us from Raha. So it's a prayer of relaxation. So the idea of that many rakats, you know, is that you're re reading the Quran and you're living with the verses, you know, not something that, you know, makes you tired. Yeah. Uh, and so the brothers explained to me that, no, you don't have to do the 20. Take your time. You do what you can do. And um, this is a special prayer in this month. So once I realized that, then I got a balanced view of, yeah. of, of Ramadan. Alhamdulillah, I fasted the whole month. Uh, I was very serious. You know, and by the end of the month, I had learned to make my prayers, understood the basic foundations, you know, and then I was, you know, ready to go like a horse. Yeah. You know, you, you, you let him out, man. You, you were feeling in the race. It, was, it was the tranquility. I, I was peace. feeling it. Mm. Yeah. You know, the change had come over my life. The world view was there. Um, and now I was ready to see the world and to travel, you know, with this new um, uh, understanding and this new brotherhood I, I had latched onto, you know, really opened up the door for me to be able to travel to other parts of the world. Now you know what the purpose of life was? The question was answered in this verbatim word of God, the Quran, clear? Yeah. What you were doing in this life from A to Z, your blueprint, instruction on how to live, everything right. was clear? Yeah. No ambiguity? Mean, okay, you know, when you're coming into any new way of life, yeah. there are some things that are not totally clear. Yeah. And so this is where um, knowledge comes in. Okay. So really, you know, a person coming into Islam, it, it's about seeking knowledge. And it's about... Um, learning this lifestyle because when we used to pray you know as Christians um, we didn't do a complete physical prayer mm -hmm. we prayed uh, spiritually and mentally you know so now there's a physical prayer there's a movement you know it's, it's a complete prayer of the prophets you know when we used to fast you know you'd only fast from eating meat or something yes. like that and Lent and you know certain we didn't do the complete fast mm -hmm. now it's the complete fast yeah. When we used to give charity, you know, we would give to the poor, but it wasn't an institutionalized form of, of zakat or charity or, or poor do, you know, which really you know, is, 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 is changing your whole attitude towards your money. Yeah. Uh, Tawheed, the oneness of God now, you know, I had to learn what it really meant, all the aspects of the Tawheed. Pilgrimage, I had to prepare myself to travel you know, you know, to the east, you know, to really go to the Holy Lands. So now, um, this is a change that you have to go through. And, um, but for me, you know, I was open, I was ready, um, you know, I, was, I was willing to you know, investigate things. My, you know, you know, my mind was set. Uh, and so it, it was easy for me to, ma to make the change you know, into Islam. We're excited hearing this. The viewers are excited. We're going to take a break. We'll be right back with more. I am not afraid to stand alone. I am not afraid to stand alone. If a lies by my side, I am not afraid to stand alone. I am not afraid to stand alone. If a lies by my side, I am not afraid to stand alone. I am not afraid to stand alone. If a lies by my side, I am not afraid to stand alone.
So your journey is getting excited as you go along. It's getting more exciting. You're learning and you're starting to implement the way of life of all the prophets. Islam, what goes on from here? So from here, um, I run into Muslims who, who are involved in the Sunnah. They say it's the Sunnah. Yeah. So I say, what is the Sunnah? They say, okay, there's a different lifestyle in the sense that you, you can eat. So you learn to eat sitting down with your hands. You, you wash yourself and you know, you're wearing loose clothing. You know, and um, you know, the way that you relate to people, um, you know, a humble way but strong way. You know, so I'm learning this Sunnah, which is the lifestyle of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Can you translate? How do you translate? The way? Yeah, so you can say that the methodology and the lifestyle and the way of the Prophet. Can you, if you link this back to Jesus' time, Moses' time, mm -hmm. those people following them, were they on the Sunnah of their Prophet at that time, the way? Exactly, because really the Prophet uh, is the one who, um, he's the example. Mm -hmm. And so his life exemplifies the book itself. And, and that's what the Sunnah is. It is bayan. It is the clear evidence of the book. So the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, as described by his wife Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, he was the Qur'an walking and talking. Mm -hmm. So he was the living book. And so this now, when you start to implement the Sunnah uh, in terms of you know, your lifestyle, now it's changing your lifestyle. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and so this um, is important because by changing your lifestyle, how you move, you're able to leave the boxed-in American culture and then travel to other cultures. Because the one thing consistent you know, for Muslims all throughout the world you know, is this practice of the lifestyle based on the Quran and the Sunnah. So you can go to China, you can go to India, South America, Africa, Europe, wh wherever, and you'll find somebody who's on the same lifestyle. You pray together. You pray together. Th th there's nothing like you go to this mosque or this place of worship and they're reciting something totally different. Mm -hmm. Everything is unified, the same, praying in the same direction. That's right. The Arabic language being used, there. you know, and, and, and you know, even the way that people relate to each other. I mean, yeah. you, you can tell that a person, you know, is a Muslim because, you know, they're, 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 they're humble with you and they give you your limits, yeah. you know, they know the limits, you know, what not. And, you know, so there's a certain air about a Muslim who's practicing it. And that's something, you know, that, that you can find all over the world. Yeah. Well, so, so I was adapting, coming out of a rough street type of life, yeah. you know, and, and, and now being refined. Because being Muslim is, is really like what we would call, it's, it's being noble. Yeah. It's really noble, man. It's, it's high character. So it's worshiping the one God and developing your character to be the best human being that you can be? Exactly. Yeah. So, so, so this really uh, was a stage of development for me, which was very important. Uh -huh. um, and, and I went through this, fortunately, in Toronto at the time. It had a very large immigrant population. So there were people from different parts of the Muslim world who were here, and I interacted with them. And um, I began to learn this lifestyle, you know, and, and started looking towards, you know, the East, in a sense, to go to the Holy Land and, you know, to learn Arabic and to learn more about my faith. This is amazing because you went on from being a Christian, experimenting, looking at all the other world religions, you came to know that this was the truth from the creator of the heavens and the earth, and you became an Islamic scholar, and there's so much more we need to talk about. Would you agree to continue in another program the rest of your story? Definitely. All right, so God willing, we're going to do another episode next week. Join us where we continue sharing the Sheikh's experience on how he came to Islam. Thank you. May God Almighty Allah reward you. Thank you. Sir, and thank you for tuning in to another episode of The Dean Show. Same time, same channel next week for the rest of this exciting story. We'll see you then. Assalamu alaikum. Peace be unto you. He created the universe, to him belong the heavens and the earth, the ever living, he is the first, he's the owner of mercy, he sent his messengers to warn his creatures of the grave dangers of worship. There is none greater than the Creator.